Year 5 created four films exploring the rights of the child. Topics included freedom of expression, health and the environment, racism and the right to learn and use one's own language, and the protection of children from exploitation and child labour. We have the right to use our own language, culture and religion, even if these are not shared by most people in the country where we live. The Soweto Uprising was a series of demonstrations and protests led by black school children in South Africa that began on the morning of 16th June 1976. Students from various schools began to protest in streets of Soweto in response to int introduction of Afrikaans as the medium of instruction in black schools. A boy called Hector Peterson was shot by the police and sparked a series of events which eventually led to the end of apartheid years later. The lady and Tiro's baby sister, Dimio, was very sick. Their mother worked very far away in the city of Joburg. So their auntie and grandmother looked after them. Can't we take Dinio to the hospital? Dinio is too sick to be carried that far and we don't have the money to pay a doctor. Feeling very worried, Naledi and Tiro decided to travel to Joburg to get their mother without telling anyone. They started walking. They found the road hard going and the hot road burnt their feet. A friendly driver offered them a lift to go back on the street road. Where are you kids going? We're walking to Johannesburg. Are you crazy? That's more than 250 kilometres away. The children explained. Hmm, it will take you a week to walk there. OK, hop on. I'll take you to Johannesburg. Thank, Thank you. you. The journey passed quickly. They discussed how their mother worked in Johannesburg to pay for them to go to school. They told the driver that uh, their father had worked in uh, a mine and died of coughing sickness. <coughs> this must be Joburg. This is where I stop. Where does your mother work? Parktown. I'm late for my delivery, otherwise I would take you there myself. There's a bus stop around the corner of Parktown. Come, I'll show you. He gave the children some money for the bus. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Are you stupid? The signs on the bus. This bus is not for you. A lady called Grace showed them uh, where to get the right bus. She was outspoken uh, and angry about uh, apartheid. They talked about the dangers of the police and how people always needed to carry their ID. We wear that, that policeman, he, he wants to see a pass. He'll, he'll say it's not an order, order. the day, day might be your last. Finally, they reached the house where Mama worked. The children were reunited with their mother, Joyce. You can't leave now, Joyce. You can go tomorrow. Your kids can't stay here. Grace said they could stay with her. Grace and the children got on a busy train to Soweto. Naledi and Tiro got to Grace's house and met her brothers. The children asked about a photo on their wall. In the photograph was Grace's brother, Doomy. Grace began to tell the story of Doomy. This is my brother, Doomy. During the time of fire, 
I marched with Jimmy in the streets uh, with thousands of other school children. Hundreds were killed by the police, hundreds were wounded, and hundreds were arrested, including Jimmy. After his release, he disappeared. They later got a letter saying he was safe and living in another country. The children met Mama at the train station and began the journey home. Mama paid for a car to take them to their house to collect dinero and then take them to the hospital. When they arrived, they had to queue for a long time to see a doctor. Mama and Naledi had to leave Dino uh, at the hospital and return in three days because she was very sick. Mama went to the hospital and the children stayed and waited for her to return. The days passed slowly. Excitedly, they saw Mama return and carry a Dino on her back. It's Mama. It is. Dino's on her back. The family was worried about paying back the money they had borrowed, as well as making sure that Dino had enough milk and fruit. Tyro wondered if he was old enough to work and help. Nalady decided she wanted to be a doctor and help people. She thought about how the journey to Joburg had saved Dino's life and had opened her eyes so much. We have the right to protection from work that is bad for our health. In the time the story of Oliver Twist was taken, they exploited kids and made them do work which they were not supposed to do. Chimney sweeps were extremely common during the Victorian period. Sweepers were mainly children. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Oliver Twist was born in the 1830s, England. His mother, whose name no one knew, died just after Oliver's birth. Oliver spent the first nine years of his life in a badly run home for young orphans and was then transferred to a workhouse. Life in the workhouse was tough, but the worst thing of all was the lack of food. For meal times, the children were given one ladle of grey, watery gruel. One evening, the boys bullied Oliver to ask him for more food. Please, sir, I want some more. More? Mr Bundle, the head of the parish, offered five pounds to anyone to take the boy away from the workhouse. Oliver narrowly escaped working for a cruel chimney sweep and was instead apprenticed to a local undertaker, Mr Sowerbury. When the undertaker's other apprentice, Noah Claypool, made horrible comments about Oliver's mother, Oliver attacked him. Oh, help! It wasn't me, sir! He attacked me first! Oliver was punished by Mr Sowerbury. Desperate, Oliver ran away and travelled to London. There on the streets, Oliver, starved and exhausted, sank to the ground. Oliver heard a voice ask, Got lodgings? Something to eat? Money? The daughter looked about the same age as Oliver. Awful that is my name. Come with me, mate. Oliver followed Dodger through the narrow and muddy streets until they reached Fagin's house. Who's this then? Fagin, this is Oliver Twist. You like it, yeah. <laughs> Fagin was an old thief who trained orphan boys to pickpocket for him. After a few days of training, Oliver was sent on a pickpocketing mission with two other boys when he saw them swipe a handkerchief from an elderly gentleman. Oliver was horrified and ran off. He was caught but escaped being convicted of the theft. 
Wait, don't hurt him. Mr. Brownlow, the man whose handkerchief was stolen, took pity on the feverish Oliver and took him to his home and nursed him back to health. We need to find that boy before he snitches on us. A few weeks later, when Oliver was running errands for Mr. Brownlow to buy some books from the bookshop, two of Fagin's gang, Bill Sykes and Nancy, spotted him. Bill grabbed him and returned him to Fagin. Please return Mr. Brownlow's books and money or he will think I stole them. We can sell these. Fagan kept Oliver locked up alone for days and he became very ill. Nancy felt sorry for Oliver and secretly returned the books and money back to Mr. Brownwell. Later, Sykes forced Oliver to help him burgle a house. And Oliver was shot by a servant. The owner of the house, Mrs. Maley, and her niece, Rose, looked after Oliver as he was recovering. Sykes accused Nancy of betraying him and Fagin and attacked her. When the police found out, they chased Sykes onto the roof of a tall warehouse where he slipped and fell to his death. Fagin was arrested and punished for his crimes. Oliver was reunited with Mr. Brownlow, and they and Mrs. Maley and Rose all moved to a beautiful large house in the countryside. We have the right to the best health possible and a clean and safe environment to live in. In the Amazon rainforest, thousands of animals are forced to leave their home called the deforestation. This not only affects animals, but also affects the tribes around them. The Great Kapok Tree Two men walked into the rainforest. The larger man stopped and pointed to a great kapok tree. Then he left. The smaller man took the axe he carried and struck the trunk of the tree. Whack! The sounds of the blows ran through the rainforest. Chop! 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 Soon the man grew tired. He sat down to rest at the foot of the great kapok tree. A bow constrictor lived in the kapok tree. He slithered down its trunk to where the man was sleeping. He looked at the gash the axe had made in the tree. Then the huge snake slid very close to the man and hissed in his ear. Senor, this tree is a tree of miracles. It's my home where generations of my ancestors have lived. Do not chop it down. A bee buzzed in the sleeping man's ear. Senor, my hive is in this kapok tree, and I fly from tree to tree and flower to flower, collecting pollen. In this way, I pollinate the trees and flowers throughout the rainforest. You see, all living things depend on one another. Senor, do you know what we, what we animals and humans need in order to live? Oxygen. And Senor, do you know that trees produce oxygen if you cut down the forest you will destroy that which gives us all life a 
A troop of monkeys scampered down from the canopy of the cake pock tree. They chatted to the sleeping man. Senor, you have seen the ways of man. You chop down one tree and come back for another and another. The roots of these great trees will wither and die, and there will be nothing left to hold the earth in place. When the heavy rains come, the soil will be washed away and the forest will become a desert. A toucan, a macaw and a flock of birds flew down from the canopy. Senor, squawked the toucan, you must not cut down this tree. We have flown over the rainforest and seen what happens once you begin to chop down the trees. Many people settle on the land. They set fires to clear the underbrush. And soon the forest disappears. Where there once was life and beauty, only black and smouldering ruins remain. A bright and small tree frog crawled along the edge of a lake and squeaky voice piped in the man's ear. Senor, a ruined rainforest means ruined lives. You will leave many of us homeless if you chop down this great K-pop tree. A jaguar leaped down and padded silently over the sleeping man. He growled in his ear. <gasps> Senor, the K-pop tree is home to many birds and animals. If you cut it down, where will I find my dinner? <gasps> tribe who lived in the rainforest knelt over the sleeping man. She murmured in his ear, Senor, when you awake, please look upon us all with new eyes. The man awoke with a start. Before him stood the rainforest child and all around him surrounding the creatures who depended on the great cave oak tree. What wondrous and rare animals they were. The man stood and picked up his axe. He hesitated, then he dropped the axe and walked out of the rainforest. We have the right to discover things and express ourselves through making art and speaking and writing. From when Pablo Picasso was a child, he learned to express himself through his art. When his friend passed away, to show his emotions, he made dark and sad pictures. Pablo Picasso grew up in Spain where he was born on October 25th, 1881. He could draw and paint just about anything and in any style. He liked to experiment and try out new ideas. Pablo's father, Jose, who was a painter and art teacher, recognised the boy's talent at a young age and encouraged him to pursue art. Pablo painted his first paint painting aged nine, depicting a bullfighter. When Pablo was 13 years old, Jose was painting a picture of the pigeons when he had to leave the room. He returned to find Pablo had completed the picture and it was so amazingly beautiful and lifelike that he gave his son his own palette and brushes and never painted again. 
His father took him to Madrid to visit his most famous museum, El Prado. Picasso hoped that his paintings would one day be hanging on the walls next to the work of great Spanish masters like Goya, Velázquez and El Greco. Pablo became very sad. For the next four years, his paintings were dominated by the blue colour. Many of the subjects were sad and sombre looking. He painted people with elongated features and faces. Some of his paintings from this period included the old guitarist and poor people on the seashore. Today, Pablo Picasso is considered the greatest artist of the 20th century. Many people consider him to be one of the greatest in all of art history. Picasso valued the creativity in children. He famously said, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. When I'm older, I would like to be like Picasso and because like I have this whole like of desk of colouring pencils and crayons. So then like when I'm feeling blue, like when um, Picasso's friend Carles died, he felt blue and he had to express himself through his emotions. That's how I feel and that's how I express myself through my emotions and yeah.